church. Um, I will be reading from Mark chapter 14, verse 12 to 26. The heading reads, The Preparation for Passover. On the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his di disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and prepare the Passover so that you may eat it? So he sent two of his disciples and told them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Wherever he enters, tell the owner of the house. The teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make the preparations for us there. So the disciples went out, entered the city, and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. When evening came, he arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining and eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him one by one, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, the one who is dipping bread in the bowl with me. For the Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for him if he had not been born. As they were eating, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. My name is Raino. If we have not met, I have the privilege of serving this church as pastor and as elder, and I have the privilege of preaching the word this morning. We are currently in a series called Gospel Fluency. The first week we spoke about what gospel fluency is. We said it's the ability of the Christian to know how the gospel is applicable to their lives in every dimension without really having to think about it. It's the same way speaking a language fluently just comes without you thinking it. And we spoke about um, being gospel uh, fluent means that we are a church that has a unity, that has a diversity, that has a maturity. And in all of those three sections, we spoke about what the gospel actually means to us. And then we said, if you are fluent in the gospel, you will be able to apply this portion of scripture to your life. Second week, we spoke about idolatry. You might remember we said that there's a, a natural tendency for humans to move towards idolatry. Paul says idolatry is madness, and Paul says idolatry leaves you miserable. Last week, Lesecho spoke about identity, and the main point was that our identity in Christ, the identity that we get because of the gospel, because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus, is the identity that should be above all other identities we could possibly have. How has the series been so far? I'm curious to know if anyone is fasting with me. You'll remember, first week I said, I'm going to fast for eight weeks and I'm going to pray that God revives this church. You all nodded. I don't know if anyone is fasting with me. I wonder if anyone has experienced revitalization and a deepening in their faith so far. Because that's what we're trusting God for. Please share it if you have that story. Wouldn't it be awesome if the people of Fellowship City are people who experience life and life in abundance and people whose lives actually show joy and peace, and love, and identity, and a move away from idolatry? Wouldn't it be awesome if we would speak the gospel fluently? I can tell you now that that is God's will for His children, and it's God's will for our church. So I need you to be present, and I need you to think about what we're busy with. This can't just be another sermon and another Sunday. We are on a journey here, and we're looking for participation in this journey. And we want everyone to participate in this journey so that we can grow and that we can mature and that we can be a faithful witness. Today we're going to talk about the gospel around the table. How do we experience the gospel around the table? There's your three points. Really simple. The table has a host. 
Jesus is the ultimate host. We'll see it. The table has a feast. Jesus is the ultimate feast. We'll see that in our teaching text. And the table has a promise. And we'll see in this portion of Scripture that Jesus makes the ultimate promise. While we are around the table, you and I, seeing and experiencing a host, a feast, and a promise, we experience the gospel. Have you ever thought about it that way? This afternoon, as a city group, we'll have lunch. And before lunch, I will say something about the host, the feast, and the promise of being fed. And then I will remind us that this is the gospel right in front of us. And we get to see it, experience it, and taste it every time we eat. Eating is awesome. Don't know about you guys. I myself love eating. It's a multi-sensory experience, right? You feel it. You smell it, you taste it, you see it. If you do eat something that crunches, you even hear it. Like it, take, it, it encompasses all your senses. Eating is something that we should not do alone. Sometimes we do eat a meal alone, but eating is something that brings us into community. That's why we shared our favorite memory of a meal around the table. Eating is a place where we are vulnerable. I don't know about you guys, but I don't go and eat with a rifle and knives and weapons and great arguments. Like when I go and eat, I take off my ring, I take off my watch, I empty my pockets. I'm really vulnerable because around the table I'm with people. And none of us are going to make war with one another, right? We're experiencing a feast. Eating is an important theme in the Bible. God provides food to His people before the fall and after the fall. Sin entered humanity by food. Peter had a huge revelation in Acts chapter 9 and 10 that was all about food and that propelled the gospel into a whole new direction. Jesus' first miracle happened at a wedding feast, not a wedding fast, right? People were eating and dancing and enjoying themselves and celebrating. Jesus himself fed multitudes of people, thousands, the gospel records. Then we've got this beautiful teaching text of today that is all about Jesus and his disciples doing what? Eating again. If you read the Gospel of Luke from Luke 9 to 19 as Jesus is on the road from Galilee to Jerusalem, you could pretty much tag that as the battle of the banquets. I thought that was quite cool. Do you guys remember when we were teenagers, battle of the bands competitions? It was a big thing, you know. But the battle of the banquets, Jesus eats and then he eats again and then it says he eats again and he eats again and he eats again. Sometimes he eats with the outcasts, sometimes he eats with the religious leaders, uh, but it's banquets and food the whole time. The gospel is on display every time we eat and drink in this way. Check this. Something comes into us from outside of us to keep us alive physically. The gospel works the same way. Jesus does something outside of us, and then he dwells inside of us so that we can live. It's a really simple way to view it, but it is a really profound way to view it. This is called the Lord's Supper, or the communion, right? Our teaching text. This was the culmination of the gospel on display. Why? Because Jesus said, look, my body Look, my blood. Like every time you eat, you'll see the gospel, but this specific meal, I am going to show you exactly what I mean when I say my body and my blood, the bread and the cup. And as Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper or the communion, His disciples was around the table. They had unity across all their man-made divides. And they were hosted and loved and given to by their Lord. That's the gospel. God giving, people receiving, and in the people receiving, they are united with Him. That's the gospel around the table. And Jesus chose this moment during Passover to say, I want to show you something. And I can imagine one day when we would watch the 400K replay of that evening, I think His disciples went, what? Because he said, guys, I've got something to show you. Really, really important. Sometimes we get so familiar with this that we get unfamiliar with it. 
I said it the first week, I had the privilege of being in Limpopo this week in Mokopane. And um, as I was driving uh, towards the place where we went, it was this beautiful valley with these blush trees and these creeks and rivers running through it. And when we got to the game farm and I said to the guys, how beautiful is the road to your farm? My word. They said, oh, yeah, we don't notice it anymore, to be honest. Actually, it frustrates us because there's no cell phone signal. Like, we can't get work done. And I'm like, guys, you have gotten familiar with this. I'm not familiar with it, and it absolutely blew my mind. We can't be so familiar with the gospel and with food and with feasting and with being hosted and with the promise of being nourished that we get unfamiliar with it. So I'm praying today that we would have our minds blown by this awesome meal and the privilege of sitting around a table. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we look to you this morning, hosting us, feeding us, and promising eternal life with you to us. I pray that we would be changed, transformed, inspired, edified, and that we would be launched into the world to share this good news of this great host, this ultimate feast, and this beautiful promise. Please help us to be attentive to your spirit now as we unpack the scriptures. We are here now for you, Lord Jesus, and for no one and for nothing else. We want to hear from you. Teach us and guide us. We pray that in your name. Amen. I've already said that this happened at Passover. Okay, Passover was a yearly festival that the Israelites slash Jewish people celebrated. And what they celebrated was the exodus out of Egypt and specifically the angel of death passing their houses back in the day, back in Egypt. Jesus chooses this moment and then he declares himself, listen, to be the true and the better sacrificial Passover lamb who came, who lived, and who's going to die once and for all for the sins of mankind. Jesus reveals the meaning of his death, that's an important word, at a meal. Jesus has already said to his people, I'm going to die. Some wanted to rebuke him, some didn't know what he meant, and now Jesus has to explain this to them. And I want you to see that he didn't pull out a PowerPoint. He didn't pull out a formal academic lecture. He chose a time and event, a meal, during the Passover feast to say, this is what my death means. The reformers, historical folk, who was part of the reformation of the church, they believed that two things were central in worship when the church gets together. The one is the preaching of the word, that's what I'm doing now, and the other one is the table. Because the reformers said, and I love this, preaching, what I'm doing now, preaches to the ear, but the table preaches to the eye. And they said we needed preaching to the ear and to the eye and then to the hand and then to the mouth. Then you really get preached too. It's not only the reformers who thought this was important. This was also the pattern of the New Testament church. Acts 20, Luke is writing. He says, on the first day of the week, we assembled to do what? To break bread. The Last Supper or the Lord's Supper or communion appears in all four Gospels. And it highlights the significance of this moment. Luke says, do this in remembrance of me. John uh, adds the washing of the disciples' feet. This was a really important meal. And you and I need to pay attention. And then we need to do as the Lord commanded. Because I'm trusting that this will literally change every meal you eat from today onwards. Let's look at the first one. The table has a host. And then saying, Jesus is the ultimate host. This entire passage, 12 to 25, it's, it didn't all fit onto one slide. Okay, so I'll work through the highlights, the bold and underline, and then uh, I would like you to journey with me as we go through this. This entire passage displays the fact that Jesus is the host. Can you guys see it? How is he the host? Well, he arranges the place for the meal. That's verse 12 to 16. The disciples ask him, where will we have this meal? Because this meal was supposed to be celebrated within the walls of the city. And then we see Jesus pulling out a big one. It's called divine ordering. It only happens a couple of times in the Gospels that Jesus says, listen, I've already arranged. You'll see. I've got someone on the inside. 
You just go and do what I say, and it's going to happen. And as you follow the text, you'll see that they asked him, and he sent, and they went. I like that one. I'm going to use that as a line in my next sermon. Jesus says, uh, no, Jesus said, and then they went. Or he sent, and then they went. I'll still work on it. I've got a week to go until that sermon. No, I'm joking. So he sends them. They find the man carrying a water jar. They follow him to a specific house. He shows them a large furnished upper room, verse 15, and he, they get it ready for the Passover. Everything happens just as Jesus told them. Quick note here. Jesus Christ is in charge of Passion Week. He knows exactly what's going on. And this is one of, one of those important passages where we have to see that. Jesus is on his way to get crucified, but he's not flustered. Okay, I know Gethsemane will still happen, but he enters Gethsemane in a certain posture. Something happens in Gethsemane, and then he exits Gethsemane with that same posture. Jesus does not get flustered. He knows exactly what he's doing. Have you ever been hosted by someone and then really be put at ease because they know what they're doing? Hmm? We've got friends like that. Like when we go to them, everything is just always perfect. And I never have to wonder, yeah, is the meat all right on the bra? Is everything all right in the oven? It seems like we're missing dinner time for the kids because they know exactly what they're doing. Brings comfort to the person being hosted if the host knows what they're doing. He makes the plans. These events did not catch him off guard. There's not a hint of desperation or fear or anger in Jesus. He arranges the meal. Secondly, as a host, he also presides over the meal. That's the whole section, verses 17 to 25. Now, I wish that I had time today to walk you through the 11 steps of the Passover meal. It's actually a beautifully structured and beautifully ordered meal in which the bread has a place, the cup has a place, giving thanks has a place. The host has a very specific role during the Passover meal to make sure that we do everything in the right order and that everything happens at the right time. They would have sung hymns. There would have been conversation. There would have been dialogue. There would have been teaching. There would have been prayer. And through the whole meal, they would have drunk four cups. Is that the right word? Would have drunk. Would have dranken. Would have drunken. I don't know. I don't know what the perfect tense is. Drunk. Okay? They would have drunk four cups. I'll get back to that later. Just tuck that one away. It's an important note. Now we see Mark starts in 1418. And when he starts uh, describing exactly what they did, we find them kind of already in progress, right? So they are way into the Passover meal already. That's a trademark of the Gospel of Mark. He doesn't write too much detail. He just gives you what you need to know to show that Jesus is actually the King and the promised Messiah. Okay, now in verse 22 to 25, we see Jesus presiding over the meal. Because exactly like the host would have explained stuff, Jesus is explaining the bread and he's explaining the cup, which is clear to us that he is the host. I just mentioned we have friends who's really good hosts. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever had a good host? Are you a good host to people? Do you enjoy hosting people? And the reason why I'm asking you these questions is because we need to know and believe that we are hosted by Jesus Himself forever. It's an important experience for the Christian. Every time we come to His table, what does He do? He feeds us. When we draw near to God, who, who said draw near to God this morning? Was it Bethany or was it Lesicho? I think it was Lesicho. Yeah. When we draw near to God, we receive grace from Him. Not only is it up to us to draw near to Him or to come to His table, God invites us and says, come to me, I will give you rest. Just like a host would invite you and say, come to us so that we can eat together. Not only that, Jesus says to the disciples, I'm not hosting you once, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'll host you forever. Jesus is the ultimate host. And the only question that I want to ask you around this point is, do you know Him in this way? Do you know Jesus as your host? Because when you sit down around a table and you look at the host, or when you host people yourself, that has to show us a picture of Jesus. Because that's exactly what He did to us. 
In our house, I am the dad. So when we sit down for dinner, we eat around the table. I always open up with a word. And my word is ladies. I only have three ladies. It's really good to be with you. Welcome to dinner. It's been a long day. We've had a lot of stuff going on. Now is the time to get nourished, to enjoy mom's good food, and to be together and to have conversation. I welcome them to our table. I settle them at the table. If you have small kids, parenting tip, you have to settle them at the table. They're not going to settle themselves, you know. <laughs> but I settle them because I want them to be at ease and I want them to enjoy the food. That is exactly the same way that Jesus hosts us. If you are a Christian, sorry, if you are not a Christian, let me just say this. It's not because you're not welcome to come. Jesus invites you to come to him and to feast. That's the key of the gospel. The way that we can come to his table, the way that we can feast with him, the way that we can be in relationship with him, the way that his promises is true to us is through his death and through his resurrection and then with his spirit dwelling inside of us. That's all part of the good news. That's why we believe in Jesus, is so that we can sit around His table and be hosted by Him. You are invited. Any person who's not a Christian, it's not because you're not welcome to come. You are invited by the ultimate host. Let's look at the second one. The table has a feast. And this is important. Jesus is the ultimate feast. Now guys, you need to focus now. Because I'm going to take you down a rabbit hole. We're going to go really, really deep into symbolism. And then you're going to go, I've never seen that. It's so cool. Are you ready? I myself am a Bible nerd. It's on my LinkedIn profile. No, I'm joking. But I can. I, mean, I can put it there. Jesus is not only the host, but check this. In the Lord's Supper, He is actually the meal. I'll show you how. We see that he's reinterpreting the elements. Jesus changes and revises the Passover meal that Moses said was to be done as an ongoing memory or an ongoing memorial in Exodus chapter 12 verse 14. Why can Jesus do this? Well, it's because the Passover meal was pointing to something greater and to someone greater. And who is that something or someone greater? It's Jesus himself. Okay, so how does he reinterpret it? Let me show you. Firstly, the bread. Verse 22 says, As they were eating, he took bread. Now these words occur probably between the second cup of wine and the third cup of wine, which in the Passover meal is in the time when everyone is eating. So it makes sense. Jesus is following the normal sequence, and it's time to eat now. It's time for the host to break bread, and now he goes, oh, teaching moment. I want to show you something as I break the bread. There's seven verbs in verse 22. Eat, take, bless, break, give, say, and take. All of them are things that Jesus does. And who does he do it for? He does it for them. So see the generosity of the host, fam. Jesus gives them food to eat more than enough. And not only does he give them food to eat more than enough, he keeps on giving to them. And then he says, I will give you even more. And what is that? I will give you my person, my being, myself, my body. The Greek word here for body is not the word flesh. It's the word being. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to give you my flesh. He says, I'm going to give you myself. Do you see that? It's cool to have a language that has two words for body, right? Jesus probably spoke Aramaic, his native tongue, when he sat around the table with the disciples. And the word that he used there, the Aramaic word for body, also means my person. So look at the host. Here's food. Eat. Here's more food. Eat. In this abundance, I'm going to add more, and that is myself. What a host. What a host. You guys know what it's like to be hosted by someone, and there's just way too much food to eat. 
I love it. It's the great, it's the best feeling ever. Because I know that I can chow and chow and chow and chow and enjoy and feast and it's just not going to end. It's like Kuliso's chicken wings. Ask him about it. It's really great. He has the gift of multiplication. We couldn't finish it. And fam, I'm known for finishing stuff. But it's really, really great. Or maybe ask Katlecho and AJ when they're bride. I don't know. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> Jesus will give himself holy and without reserve. Okay. The unleavened bread in Exodus during the Passover symbolized the haste and the danger of the Exodus. Right? We need to move, guys. We are in trouble. So the unleavened bread came to represent the afflictions and the trials of the people in Egypt and then in the wilderness. So the presider over the Passover would say, this is the bread of our affliction. And then he would break it. And they would be reminded of their affliction, their suffering, their haste, and their danger. And now Jesus says, this is the bread of whose affliction? My affliction. You guys have no part in the suffering. I'm doing it all for you. And this should remind you of my affliction. The bread represents Jesus' torn flesh. Think about it, guys. Come on now. Let's go back to Exodus. Think of the Exodus. Think of Moses. Think of the suffering of the people. Think of the salvation and the Exodus that happened. Jesus says, I am leading the ultimate Exodus. Jesus says, I am the ultimate Moses. Jesus says, this is the ultimate suffering and no one will have to suffer again after this. Jesus says, you were saved once from uh, 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 slavery in Egypt. Now I'm going to proper save you forever. This is the ultimate salvation. This was the Israelites or Jewish people's uh, most important memory of what God has done in their history. And now Jesus says, my death is the ultimate moment in the history of the world. Like, we should remember this, but I'm doing something now that you should remember forever. The death there of the Passover lamb was important. My death is even more important. And all other deliverances and places that God has saved you before all pointed to what I am going to do now. He reinterprets the bread. It's phenomenal now, isn't it? Okay. Now he reinterprets the cup. Look at verses 23 and 24. Taking this third cup, Jesus gives it to the disciples. So it's between the bread and the cup while they are eating. And in verse 24, as Jesus takes this cup, it, we reach the climax of the meal. And Jesus says in verse 24, This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. The life of a creature resided in its blood. So when you say blood, you also mean life. And Jesus says, the reference to this cup is my blood, meaning this is my life. And I'm giving it to you. Matthew adds in Matthew 26, 28, that Jesus says, for the forgiveness of sins. No blood, no forgiveness. No blood, death. Blood, forgiveness. Blood, life. Do you guys see it? So this is the bread of my affliction. I am going to do something greater than what was done back in history. And this is my life. And I am going to now give it to you. He's going to give up, give up his life as part of a new agreement. And that agreement isn't a deal or a contract. It's a covenant. For what? For their forgiveness, so that they can live. That's the new meaning of the cup. Do you guys remember I said there's four cups? We're going to get to the meaning of the four cups in a Passover meal. But Jesus says this third cup is something new. And I'm reinterpreting it. Question. Where's the lamb? Did you guys pick up that there's no lamb? There's supposed to be a lamb. They prepped the lamb, but there's no lamb. We read of the bread and the cup. This would have been a strange Passover without a lamb. Or was there a lamb? Come on now, come on. Mark is selective. Mark doesn't tell us everything, 
But it appears that there is no lamb at the table. Why? Because the lamb was not on the table because the lamb of God was reclining at the table. Do you guys see it? Do you see it? It's awesome. No lamb for us today. I am the main course. An animal can ultimately, can't ultimately substitute for the sin of a person. Only a person can. So when we eat the lamb, we put our trust in the animal. Now there's no lamb to eat, but there's a lamb around the table, and that is the lamb of God. I'm not joking, guys. The scripture says it. John 1, John the Baptist says, this is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 5, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been slain. In Revelation, the heavenly realms shout. And what do they shout? Worthy is the lamb. There is lamb, but not on the table. The lamb is around the table. Why? To pay for their sins. Mark 10.45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the meaning of the death of Jesus. It's a substitutionary death. His death is an act of substitutionary, that means I am in your place, sacrificial love without which we cannot be saved. We have to eat it. Check this, fam. If you sit around the table and there's food on the table, you can stare at it all you want. You're not going to be fed. You're going to die if you don't eat it. Take it. Grab it. Have it. Eat it. Then you will be fed. Jesus sits around a table without lamb, saying to his disciples, it's me. You have to take me. You have to receive me. You have to accept me. Otherwise, in exactly the same way that you're going to die if you don't eat, you are going to die if you don't eat me. Do you guys see it? So there's a feast on a table, always. There's food to eat that will nourish us and that will feed us and that will give us everything we need. Jesus is the ultimate feast. Because when we take Him, we have everything that is sufficient for us. Then we'll never hunger again. Then we will be nourished. We will be fed. And it's not an animal. It is a person. Okay, up out the rabbit hole. Did you guys see it? It's brilliant. I can imagine one day seeing Jesus in His glorified state. Saying to him, Jesus, I just want to say, lovely touch at the Passover meal. Can you imagine Jesus goes, first bump, and then carries on. But he's brilliant. It's genius. And we should be no doubt what his death means. And we should be no doubt what he means to us as the ultimate feast. Do you guys see it? Give me a nod at least. Third point. The table also has a promise. Guys, when you sit around a table and you look at the food, the food promises you something. What does it promise you? It promises you that you're going to be fed. It promises you that you're going to be full. Right? When you sit around a table with a hungry stomach and you look at the food, you just know that this is going to be phenomenal. Because at the end of it, I'm going to say, Kikotsi, I'm full. I've had enough. Did I pronounce that wrong? And so why are you laughing at me? I thought, did I get it right? Okay, ta. I've, I've practiced that one a little bit, you know. Now Jesus makes the ultimate promise around the table, and I want you to see this. Look at verses 25 to 26, okay? Verse 25, Jesus speaks. And he speaks at the time where it was time for the final cup of the Passover, okay? So they've had three. It's time for the fourth cup now. And then Jesus says what he says in verse 25. And then they sing a hymn in verse 26. So did they drink the cup or not? They didn't. Fascinating to see that. Let me show you. 
Exodus chapter 6, okay, verses 6 to 7. I put some highlights in there for you because there are four promises in Exodus that God gives to His people. I will bring you out. I'll free you from slavery. I will redeem you. And I will take you to be my people. And I will be your God. Do you guys see the four promises? So the four cups at Passover, check this, was meant as a reminder of these four promises in Exodus. So when we drank the first one, we were reminded of the fact that God says, I'll bring you out. When we drank the second one, we were reminded of the fact that God says, I'll free you from slavery. And then when Jesus did the third one, what was that promise? I will redeem you. I'll give you another chance. I will deem again. I will look and evaluate your value again. You will have another go. And that's exactly when Jesus reinterpreted the cup. And he says, by my blood you will be redeemed. By my body you will be redeemed. And then look at the fourth promise. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Jesus says, that one has to wait. That's going to happen in the future. We're not going to drink that cup now. I need to drink a different cup. And what is that cup? It's the cup of God's wrath. Do you guys see how brilliant he is? Like everyone was going, cheers on the fourth. Oh, no, not, not, not cheers on the fourth one. No, I'm the only one that's going to drink now. And that's going to be the cup of God's wrath. And then one day, we will be together. And you hold on to that promise. Because, look at it, uh, uh, Rudolf, we can just have verse 25 up again, please, mate. There we go. New in the kingdom of God. That's where it's going to happen. So the promise that you were always reminded of, one is being fulfilled now, and the other one you're going to have to hold on to until the end. It's not that day yet. Instead of the fourth cup, I'm going to drink the cup of wrath. And you and I, as Christians, have the promise of lifting the cup again because Jesus drank that cup for us. All of this on the night before he was delivered. Isn't it just a phenomenal meal? Again, we should see the powerful parallels with the book of Exodus. I'm also done. Stay with, oh, I'm almost done. Stay with me. Moses, a great deliverer, deliverer, instituted the first Passover. Jesus, the greater deliverer, instituted the Lord's Supper. Moses created a people of God. Jesus is creating an even greater people of God that encompasses all the nations. The first Passover meal was held on the night before great deliverance, the deliverance from Egyptian slavery. The Lord's Supper was held on the night before an even greater deliverance, and that is what? Salvation from sin and death. Like this is the moment in what we call in theology the redemptive history. Like if you read the history of the Old Testament, this is the moment it all pointed to. Jesus makes the ultimate promise. Let me end with this. Fam, when you sit down around the table, you take what is in front of you with dependency. You know you need food. Your stomach will remind you of it. So when we sit down, we sit down in dependency, knowing that I need what is on the table. When we sit down around the table, we sit in community because it's something that we do with others. So not only dependency and community, but also expectancy. I don't know about you. I'm not Pavlov's dog. But I do start salivating when I sit around the table, to be honest. Sometimes when I bow my head over my plate and I hold the hands of my wife on this side and Ava on this side, I have to just hold back the saliva because the flavor is just hitting the nose. And that triggers my expectation for what I'm going to have now. It's exactly the same with the gospel that is on display around the table. The table is a table of grace. It's not a table of merit. We are here because of His blood, not ours. We are around the table because of His performance, not ours. 
And the same dependency you put on food, knowing that you need it, we should depend on Christ's work for us in that same way. Your salvation depends not mainly on your commitment to Jesus, but on Jesus' commitment to you. And he makes this oath with his blood. If you believe in Jesus as your substitute, as your savior, then you have a new family. And it has a stronger unity than your own family. This is a family. Okay? It's called the church of Jesus Christ. And if you believe in Him, you're part of the church. In the same way that you sit around a table with a community, the same way it works, that if you are a Christian, you are part of a community. Your class doesn't matter. Your race doesn't matter. There's something stronger than all of that, and that is the blood of Jesus. What binds us together is that we have been loved by Jesus Christ, and that we now love each other as He loved us. The church is not an event. The church is not a building. It's a community of brothers and sisters adopted by the Father, purchased by the blood of the Lamb, indwelt by the Holy Spirit. That's who the church is. And the table is a powerful display of that unity. And then if you think of expectancy, so we spoke about dependency and uh, um, community. The Lord's Supper, fam, is a look into the future. It is a preview of what is to come. Let me tell you, for those brief moments around that table, all of Jesus' disciples felt everything's okay. Why? Because I'm with my Lord. And He's giving me abundance. <laughs> and He's hosting me. And He's promising me. Like nothing, nothing but nothing can be wrong in those moments. That's a reminder of what is to come for those who trust in Him. How do we experience the gospel around the table? Well, the table has a host, the table has a feast, and the table has a promise. Jesus is the ultimate host, Jesus is the ultimate feast, and Jesus makes the ultimate promise. Gospel fluency, in this sense, means that you and I not only know Jesus as host, but that we talk about Jesus as host, that we can explain what it means to be hosted by Jesus. Being fluent in the gospel means understanding, knowing, and being able to articulate why you had to take Jesus as the ultimate feast. And what His blood means, and what His body means. Being fluent in the gospel means being able to talk about the hope and the promise of what is to come. It means not only understanding it with your head and believing it with your heart, but being able to say with your mouth why nothing in this earth can get you down and why nothing in this earth can separate you from the love of Christ and why nothing that you ever experienced in this earth can make you dejected and depressed because there's something that's waiting on us and it is beautiful and it is the ultimate promise that has ever been made. When you're fluent in the gospel, you can speak about these things. I want to ask you a question as Lesecho and Jake make their way up to lead us in a response song. Two really, really simple questions. Which one of these resonate with you this morning? I'm not going to be led to believe that it doesn't resonate at all. It's impossible. It's God wor God's word and it's opened up when His people are together. It has to resonate. Which one resonates? The host? The feast or the promise? And the second question that I want to ask you is, in which one of these do you need some revitalization? Which one of these need to be newly found for you? Which one of these do you need to see again and anew and behold and gaze at and take and believe? Just sit with those two questions. I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and then they will lead us in a response, and then I'm going to read a benediction for us, and then we'll be out of here. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for hosting us. And thank you for your affliction and for your suffering. And thank you for your life. And thank you for your promises. And thank you for your abundance. 
And thank you for your love and for your grace and for your mercy and for your performance and for your blood and for your commitment. Lord Jesus, this is the best table that we could ever sit down at. And as we sit down with you now, as your children, will you speak to us? Will you show us what this resonance in our heart means this morning? Will you revitalize us and breathe your life back into our nostrils so that we can be in awe of what you did for us? When we eat, Lord Jesus, I pray that we would not only thank you for the food, but when we eat, I pray that we would see a host, that we would see a feast, that we would see a promise, and that we would believe that that is who you are. Work in us, Lord Jesus, in a powerful and a new way. I pray that in your name. Amen.